So I want to discuss and say how to improve the sensitivity to subtle signals by stacking clusters that is superimposing in images of many clusters on the sky for a given, for a given band. Uh, I'm especially uh, interested in the peripheries of clusters where it's very difficult to see things. So this talk will be a complementary to Sasmita's talk. This will be the baryonic part. Uh, so I'm especially interested in these virial shocks or structure formation shocks that form as the baryons fall inside. Splashback is the dark matter analog of this uh, shock. Uh, so these grad students and postdocs contributed to this work, in particular, Kwan Zhu Ho uh, stacked, uh, did a very nice work on stacking low frequency radio data and is on the job market now. Um, and I won't, don't have any um, deep learning results ready to show. So as, as compensation, this is what um, an AI image uh, generator would do if you tell him to paint stacking galaxy clusters so uh, I'll try to give a complimentary introduction. So I don't think this slide was shown. It's the power spectrum of the universe. I love this slide. It compiles a lot of information and shows the hierarchical structure of the universe and also how it stopped. Once dark energy kicks in, um, you don't get any more virilization. So galaxy clusters are the pinnacle of creation. Uh, we won't get in a sense that we won't get any more massive structures to virilize. Um, the most intuitive way I know to introduce the cosmic web, which uh, galaxy clusters lie at the node of this cosmic web, is through a, a demonstration using a cup of Coke. You can do this in class when you teach, we do it. Uh, so uh, it's a two-dimensional anal analog. You can take a cup of Coke and hit it. You have small bubbles forming. These are primordial bubbles forming like in the, scene, like in the stage of decoupling, but only on the surface. Uh, and then, once you let it run, you for, they automatically form a cosmic web. Did you catch it? There was a cosmic web here of bubbles. And then filaments drain into bubbles. You get halos merging. And uh, it's, a, it's a good way to teach undergrads. Uh, this is in slow motion. So just if, uh, if the resolution is not good enough to see the web, so here I stop, enhance. And you, then you can apply any gradient or, or edge filter, and you, you catch this uh, uh, cosmic web. And it evolves in time, and it drains, so you can uh, you can do it at any time and you can then follow the merger hierarchy of halos. And it's very similar in a sense and just because bubbles attract each other very much like over densities attract each other by gravitation, bubbles lift the surface of the coke so they attract each other by buoyancy. Uh, and uh, so you already saw this merger, I'll skip it. Uh, so it, you, you sort of see the two, di two dimensions out of the three dimensions of the Zetovich approximation. So uh, you can uh, solve the density, the Lagrangian coordinates, and then uh, you don't get the first stage of collapsing along what, the first eigenvalue to form Zeldovich pancakes, but you do get Zeldovich pancakes, uh, filaments, sorry, draining into halos. So it's pretty analogous. If you want to show this in, in your lectures, in your, when teaching, so it's uh, on our YouTube channel for these and similar demonstrations. So going back to three dimensions and clusters, uh, the centers are pretty spherical, easy to stack. So most of the baryons are in this hot uh, plasma state, the intracluster medium. So I'm essentially continuing um, Priya's talk from yesterday, from, from the circumgalactic medium in galaxies to larger cluster scales. Um, dynamics is dark matter. Uh, galaxies are only a small fraction of the mass. We will shocks to zeroth order. Well, let's take them spherical and then complicate things. They're very high Mach shocks, so, and very similar to supernova remnants. We think they should accelerate particles, electrons, and protons. So these cosmic rays should fill the intracluster medium. Uh, low Mach, low Mach uh, shocks are seen everywhere in the, in the perturbed and merged clusters, uh, but I'm not sure that they accelerate particles efficiently at all. They do magnetize the plasma and introduce turbulence, etc. So all these ingredients are there, and we would like to study them, especially I'm coming from a plasma orientation, uh, but there is an elephant in the room wherever you see a simulation of a cluster, remember that we don't actually understand how they sustain their centers because just by comparing the energy, the thermal energy that you have to the X-ray luminosity, it's clear that they should lose their energy just by radiating away in the core over a giga year scale. So something must be compensating this and we don't have a self-consistent solution to the local and global thermal instability. So most simulations you'll see in clusters either don't resolve this or just turn cooling off artificially. Uh, so the shocks are uh, in reality more complicated and you might 
So if we just stack many of these, we'll just pick up the spherical uh, common denominator, which is interesting, let's do that. But in future, we would like to do a more sophisticated thing and we probably can, right? We're even able to, to stack faces. So if these non-existent people look familiar to you, then it works, we could do it in principle. Uh, galaxy clusters do, are not self-similar as Joe pointed out, but there, some of their properties are uh, approximately self-similar. So this is the pressure profile. If you normalize it by R500, which uh, was already used, it's the radius containing a, a density 500 times larger than the critical density in this universe, it, in this talk, sorry. Uh, I'll use this coordinate tau, just normalizing R by R500. So you see all of them more or less fall on the same line at the peripheries, not in the center though, but you wouldn't expect them to fall in the center on the same line, just because you see uh, once, you, uh, once, cool, uh, once you allow clusters to relax, they form a cool core, but then perturbation cause them to be disturbed. So you get the cores are, show some variability, but our peripheries are pretty nice. Say, so what about entropy? Uh, naively would expect entropy to show all this cooling and uh, feedback and other stuff going on. So you should expect some non-trivial thing to happen here, uh, but it's actually very surprising, at least to me, non-intuitive. You get a very nice linear scale uh, behavior. You, do, you don't need to normalize at all. This is just in units of megaparsec. Um, it's a bit worse if you, do, if you do normalize it, by the way. Uh, and why is this so linear? I don't think anybody knows. People are, uh, keep invoking this idea that self-similar accretion gives these profiles, but they actually don't really agree. Plus there's no reason to think that this original relaxed accretion would survive all the turmoil um, and things we see happening in the intercluster medium. So I think something dynamically is keeping these profiles linear. We don't have a good understanding why. I can give some ideas later if you're interested. Uh, galaxies, you can just count galaxies and you see once you normalize them to R200 or 500, they fall on the same line. These are different redshift slices, different mass colors, it's very universal. Uh, and uh, as was already shown, if you go to the outskirts, you see this, that the logarithmic uh, slope minus two drops uh, locally. And this is the analog of a shock experienced by the dark matter, the splashback um, effect. I want to discuss the baryonic counterpart. So spherical cow, you have just a gas in falling onto a mass M. It should form a shock, um, an accretion shock, at some radius, this, the infall velocities just from free fall are 1,000 kilometers per second or so. So it's, you can just, just extrapolate what you know about supernova remnants and rescale it and say that some fraction psi E of the energy is deposited in relativistic electrons, some fraction psi B in magnetic fields. We don't have a good understanding of these things. We would like to compute them. It's very difficult in PIC simulations to get them. And actually, the best system in the universe to study these things is probably galaxy clusters, because the upstream is not uh, contaminated by any magnetic fields, uh, uh, chemistry, nothing. It's a very simple system. We would like very much to measure this. Um, for this talk, I would like to, not, it's more difficult to, to find Xi, -E, but the product of Xi -E and the mass accretion rate, we will measure, we will measure this thing. Uh, M dot is just the mass accretion rate in units of mass times the Hubble uh, constant. Uh, so uh, once you get electron, relativistic electrons in the system, uh, they would inverse Compton scatter cosmic ray across the, the CMB, and they would gyrate in the magnetic fields and produce synchrotrons. So you, you get both inverse Compton and synchrotron, which are the same Feynman diagram. So the compute one, you know the other. Uh, you also have some protons. We don't know exactly how much energy, probably a lot goes into relativistic protons. And they, some of them manage to fill the cluster and then they have all, they have uh, inelastic collisions with ambient nucleons, produce all kinds of secondaries. Interesting things, I don't have time to discuss them now. I just want to look at the virial shocks and the signal from there. Electrons are accelerated, they should radiate right there and, and shine and show us the virial shock. And hopefully this would align with the splashback or we could compare the radii. So uh, you can simulate this. Actually, the virial shock is so easy to simulate. Uh, we, could, we did this 20 years ago with Gadget 2 and you get the same results today. Uh, we couldn't see all, with all the inner shocks, but it's not important for this talk. Uh, you can ge generate a map on the sky of all these, the outcome of the shocks. You see some, this is the coma cluster in the simulated universe. You see a ring and gamma rays around it uh, where, and it, this ring is elongated towards the main filament feeding uh, the cluster. So these rings are not spherical. They should be elongated. Um, 
So uh, the spectrum for the simulation is it's just, uh, as you would expect, it's just flat power loss, equal energy per logarithmic uh, particle energy bin. Uh, so in the gamma rays and the radio, uh, you get a similar signal. Both of them depend on this m dot xi e. The radio signal also depends on magnetic fields, synchrotron. So you also have this dependence on xi b. Uh, so you see, should see both a radio ring and a gamma ray ring. You can also see an X-ray ring if you're not exactly at the thermal peak, which block, which prevents you from seeing it. Uh, there should be a Sonia Vizadovich uh, cutoff in the Y parameter at the outskirts. It should drop suddenly, which was already also mentioned. Uh, so coma is our main, our main target, was our main target. And uh, this is before stacking. So you do see that there's a nice uh, drop at the VL radius at 2.5 or so times this R500. Uh, and it's coincident with, the, with a very strong signal in Veritas. This is 200 GeV photons. It says preliminary because the Veritas collaboration never confirmed this. They're worried about systematics that, uh, in their own TS map that they published. Uh, but we do see this in Fermi and in Ozak, and the signals are within the two order factor two systematics we have consistent with each other or a spectrum of two. So a spectrum of two is what you expect, uh, P equals two is what you expect from the ultra, ultra strong shock. It would be between two and 2.2 uh, for these kinds of shocks. Uh, well, at least we think. The difficulty of looking at one cluster is you need to worry about the details. Uh, you're looking at one cluster, you need to take, it's elongated, it has filaments. So you see these polar plots show you that all these three signals, Veritas, Fermi, and Ozat, are all elongated east-west. That's where the filament feeding uh, connecting comma to 1367 cluster goes. So they show the same structure. Uh, and uh, they have an elongation factor, which is 2.5 roughly. That's the major to minor axis ratio. I'll come back to this number, this 2.5 uh, later. So um, there are nicer targets than coma, just took us a while to figure out. So 239, 2319, this was showed like an, a more than eight sigma detection of the shock. And then we can put more efficient, more useful limits on the Mach number, uh, more than 3.2, which already gives you a power P, which is approaching two. Uh, you can all, we can also measure the galaxy uh, distribution falling off. So you can get a handle on the mass accretion rate. So this parameter M dot is about one. So finally, if you com combine Fermi, the Fermi signal for this cluster with a Z, uh, you get a, finally, this was the holy grail that we were looking for. And how much energy does a pristine shock deposit in electrons turns out to be 0.5%, much less than we thought back in the early 2000s. Um, now let's go to stacking. So this is the, the actual Fermi sky, the simulated Fermi sky. Uh, and uh, we can, of course, by rescaling, we should see the common denominator. Uh, many people have stacked galaxy clusters, failed to find a signal, uh, but all, in all these cases, they didn't normalize to the R500 or R200, mainly because they were looking for the central signal. Uh, once you do normalize, uh, the signal is very transparent. You, get, you always have some central emission from the AGNs, but then you have a very nice uh, virial ring. It's a, this is a TS detection of now more than six sigma. We're, we're following this up. Uh, it's sufficiently strong that you can see it without radial binning. This is the pinkish stuff here, but radial binning is better. Uh, and so the viral shocks, the spherical component is at 2.3 times R500. Uh, the efficiency is consistent with this 0.5% we saw from coma, 2319 and other clusters. Uh, the spectrum is consistent with two. Uh, and so this is the result of coma, it's consistent with them. So we think we have a, have a good understanding and we've detected these shocks robustly um, in the gamma rays. Uh, so the leptonic component, the inverse Compton component is well detected. What about the synchrotron component? Uh, the Veritas signal was also coincident with a W map signal, but that was a low significance thing. We would like to stack the signal. So we use, there's an advantage to go to low frequencies, very low frequencies, because then you can get rid of the galactic foreground, which is very strong. Uh, so we went to, L, uh, to LWA. This is a long wavelength array in California, in Owens Valley in California. Uh, this is the sky map that they have. Uh, Greg Hallin and his DPI. Uh, I should say. And it, the highest band, 73 megahertz, has a much better resolution than the others, so we use that one. And you see a very nice signal in flux. It's more than four sigma 
a detection. And it's exactly at the same place where we saw the gamma ray signal, uh, as you'd expect. You see also the same in low frequencies, but we co-add them because it's more difficult. The resolution there is not really good enough. And this is the image you get uh, just by stacking in high frequency, the low frequency, and both of them. Um, and when you see such an image in radio, you automatically worry that what you're seeing is ripples, interferometric ripples, uh, which is why Kwanzo spent more than a year uh, in testing and ruling out in different ways the possibility that this is an artifact. For example, you can select clusters that don't have a central uh, component, don't have a radio halo or anything like that, and you still get a signal. It's fainter because you have less clusters, but it's consistent with Poisson statistics with the number of clusters you have. Uh, you can remove some of the contamination causing this central image uh, contamination, point sources, you remove two point sources, uh, this changes the central signal completely, has no effect on the viewer radius. Uh, other tests, you can uh, show that all the signal comes from the most massive clusters, as you would expect, because the synchrotron emission is very sensitive to cluster mass. It goes like mass to the power of seven thirds uh, and other tests. So we're very con we're convinced that this is not an artifact. Um, and the signal uh, is found at the same location as the gamma rays. Uh, the efficiency in radio, you do not, you don't, you measure not only m dot times xi e, not only the electron energy, but the product with xi b. Uh, and it turns out to be consistent. So with the other measurements, with the leptonics, with the inverse Compton signal, for xi b of about two percent. So these kinds of measurements combined measure how much is that it show us that the, the shock deposits half a percent of energy in electrons and about 2% in magnetic fields. And again, so this is the best, these are the best shocks in the universe to study, unless you have a laboratory that manages to do this. And uh, the spectrum here is just shown to be two. Um, so uh, there's a small uh, uh, artifact there. It's just two point sources that were more extended than we thought, giving some two sigma residual. Don't worry about that. But this, this is a very strange thing. This, uh, this is a seen at five times R500. We didn't expect this. We can't get rid of it. No matter what subsample you check, any change in selection criteria, it persists. Looking very carefully, we also see this in gamma rays. We also see this in other channels. So there's something strange going on there. Uh, what is it? Uh, well, this is about 2.5 times more distant, uh, larger in radius than, than this uh, accretion shock that we see here. So we do not know exactly what it is. Our suspicion is that we're seeing the elongation of clusters. Uh, so two or three clusters that we saw do have an elongation factor of two to three. So it's, we think that we're seeing the common, the smallest radii, that is what is stacked most easily. This is the nearest virial shock but we can also see the, the long axis, the major axis. That might be what's contributing to this. I'm not sure. Uh, one way to, we could look is to look at this, uh, at SZ at large radii that's also been stacked. This is an image that Susmita showed. Uh, so this, uh, this is the, let me see, this is the, this is the, the brown thing is just the galaxy. So this is the splashback radii. Uh, this is the SZ uh, showing the same effect with some different radius. Uh, it slightly changes if they use SPT or Planck. So you see the radius here in which you get the, min, the, the, the sharpest decrease in the Y parameter. Um, it is not exactly what we expect. We expect it to be sort of between Planck and SPT. Uh, and they get, this is what we measure and they measure slightly different. Um, it also depends a bit how they orient the clusters, which is interesting. So if they look, if they look, uh, if they stack clusters along the long axis or perpendicular to it, this signal stays about the same position, but this thing moves. So maybe it supports this idea that we're seeing the elongation. I'm really not sure. Uh, there is something strange in this paper by uh, Anba Bajagane. I'm probably mispronouncing it. Uh, I don't know if some collaborators are here because they seem to think that this is the viewer shock, the, the more distant thing. They call it this, they call this the viewer shock, and this is shock-induced non-equilibrium. It's not clear what shocks they have in mind, maybe inner shocks. I, if this is what they're claiming, I think that's wrong. I think that this dip, the strong dip that is seen both in, in the splashback and in SZ is coincident with the very clear leptonic axis that we see. So this must be associated with the viral shock. 
this external part might be a viral shock, but then it's the more, per, more extended arm of the viral shock. I'm not really sure. So to wrap up, um, stacking normalized clusters, normalize them. Don't forget to normalize them, even if you're looking at the central source. Otherwise, you get all kinds of strange effects. This has prov proven to be very successful uh, for finding the common denominator, the spherical component uh, of clusters. Uh, we can also rotate them, like has been done in SZ. We're doing this also now and stretching them and doing other things. And then we can, uh, we're, not at the, we're not at the stage of stacking faces of clusters, but at least we can do this first order after the spherical component. Uh, but in general, we would like to think about optimized strategies, how to cl stack clusters, taking into account that they live inside a cosmic web, which has a, on a, an average three filaments feeding each cluster. Uh, this is to be done. Uh, viral shocks around clusters were finally detected after many years of attempts, uh, both in gamma rays and radio, with the significance is climbing, but it's already very, very high. Uh, and they have this. So these are uh, what we think uh, strong, uh, pristine shocks due to the plasma. Um, and we're not at the, yet at the level of doing this in tick simulations, but we're trying. Uh, coma is the best studied cluster and it shows signals uh, in, in uh, both inverse Compton and SZ and probably also synchrotron signals. There's a low far detection just this year of they call it an accretion relic, exactly where the Veritas ring is. It's coincidence, so I think it's part of, so uh, hopefully SKA, LOFAR and VLA will begin to map out these uh, shocks. And these, you sh when you're doing studies of uh, some uh, band or sky, take into account that there's an extra galactic component coming from all these superimposed shocks. It's pretty strong. It's at least 15% of the Fermi unidentified um, extra galactic background. And uh, I think we will be able to turn these kinds of studies of real shocks to be an interesting probe, not only for cos cosmology and astrophysics, but also for plasma physics, in particular shock, shock uh, physics. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Philippe. Okay. We probably again have time for two or three questions. Yeah, this is me. Yeah, um, maybe a comment. So it's nice to see that even in Fermi data, there's these two features uh, yeah. that you see. Yeah, so I think some of the confusion about whether that is the virial shock or that's the merger shock uh, comes from the fact that uh, there's this, in simulations also, you see a shock in the outskirts, which is, which is much further out than say the splashback. In some simulations. Okay, yeah. So do you I want to comment more about yeah. that? Yeah. We do not see in simulation shocks outside the virial shock. Uh, so Okay, so you see the gas. don't expect them either. These are, I mean, it's gas falling in very quick, very rapidly, free falling. And the first encounter it has with the cluster is the virial shock. You have shocks inside, but they don't accelerate particles. The weaker shocks do not accelerate particles. So it's definitely not what we're seeing. Right. So, so, um, so do you know if, if these are some, so are your simulations, are they SPH or uh, MR? I don't know uh, what simulations you're referring to. There are some simulations which show that when you have a shock coming in from the center, mm -hmm. uh, it collides with the shock and pushes it out. Yeah. There's a breathing mode. We wrote about this a decade, a decade ago. Uh, and this manages to go out, but not nearly this far. Mm -hmm. This is way too far for any of these internal shocks to reach. This, this is, so this is R200M. It's like or six, so R200M is not exactly R200C, there's like 70, yeah, 30 percent difference, I mean, but it's small. Around, but this yeah. is a huge factor, right? It's four and a half times R200. There's, there's nothing there except the arms of the filament, of the, of the viral shock mm -hmm. that push mm -hmm. out towards the filament. As far, in all the simulations that I know of, uh, that we've conducted, Okay, Both yeah, I, I, could, I could point you to the papers, yeah. So okay. there's a lot of confusion, like which shock you're seeing. Okay, thanks. Yes, I know of a paper that claimed that. I, I don't understand how that could be true. Saru? Uh, still wanted to... Two, of course. Yeah. You had a question, go ahead. Okay, really cool. Um, maybe two questions uh, about this uh, outer feature. Um, have you thought about the turnaround radius and where that would be? Um, it's not at the right place for that, or 
Um, Obviously, Smith twice. has a better person to answer that because she knows it much better than I do. But I don't understand how that how the turnaround radius could give you a, a leptonic signal, how it could give you a synchrotron or a, or a, or an inverse Compton signal. It's just that whatever uh, material is there is is sort of um, fixed in this uh, reference frame R over R two hundred. It's roughly should well spherical collapse model says it should be twice the virial radius. Absolutely, and you should see an overdensity there, but yeah, not a shock, maybe, but, but not, not a strong shock. shock. Oh, uh, yes, but you were, you were, sorry, um, before you talked about the shock, you saw other, um, another, uh, was it in the SC? I mean, you showed yes. a lot of- Yes, so right here things. you see, this is the SZ, the external one. Okay. Um, and, uh, but we've, saw, we've seen it uh, that in this one, yeah. structure, and this is leptonic. Here you have relativistic electrons radiating synchrotron. So there's magnetic fields there. It's definitely a shock. Okay. No, no turnaround could do that. Okay, it, could, it could be coincident with the turnaround with some physics we haven't thought about, but I can't imagine how you could get the turnaround radius to do something so violent to the plasma. Yeah, um, except that there are AGN, active AGN falling in radio galaxies, perhaps, and they spend, they might, in this reference frame, they might look like they hang out at that radius. I don't, I don't know. In the principle, other, the yes, thing... we've removed them as far as oh, we could. The point them. sources are removed from this analysis. Okay. They do show, the point sources show a very interesting structure. I don't have time to discuss it, but it's not in this. And, and sorry, one other um, short follow-up was you showed the radio 70 gigahertz ring yes. and you seemed skeptical of that, but that is in this, that's in this tau space, which is R over R500 or something like that. This ring you mean? Yeah. Or what is, what yes, is this tau? is a normal line. This is tau, this is R over R500. I, I'm not suspicious of this. I, I'm no. sure this is correct, but I'm just saying that whenever you have a very strong central signal in, in interferon, radio interferometry, you always get these ripples, right? That's true, but in a fixed angular space. That's one of the reasons you would not expect it to be. So it's one of the, so we conducted many tests uh, and it, you're right. That's really amazing, yeah. And you, you, you wouldn't expect anything. So we have very good clean algorithms that get rid of all the ripples. So in, in the first place, you wouldn't expect this to be, but nevertheless, nevertheless, when you show such an image to a radio astronomer, he is immediately very suspicious. So uh, it, it was a small price for me to pay when Zoe had to spend a year. One for last one. Yeah, so for the gamma ray stacks, can you uh, go back to the ring that you were able to find? Uh, yeah, this one. So there are also features in the outskirts. So are these like, um, I mean, is the significance of those features too low or like some, because it's in a stack. So it always makes me worry like whoa, what yeah. exactly is going on. Absolutely. This is why I don't think we could pu publish this without radial binning because you see this is only at the left. So these blobs are two sigma, three sigma locally. Mm -hmm. And you need to really stack radi uh, radially right, yeah. to get the signal. So I don't think this image... This image sort of after you see a signal, you can look at this map and say, okay, it's not crazy. There is something here, but I wouldn't go the other way around. <laughs> Great. Uh, there's no more questions. Let's thank Uri again and both the speakers of the session. Thanks.